Let's make this.
cries in Liberia, she cries in Ghana, and she cries in Niger. One African woman cries, we cry all over. Charles Taylor is guilty. The verdict was delivered to the 64-year-old former Liberian president nine years after his indictment by the special court for Sierra Leone. The court was set up by the United Nations and the country's government. stop the violence and flows of arms. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It really is my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth annual UNAI J. Michael Adams Lecture and Conversation Series. This series recognizes the life and work of J. Michael Adams, an educator, author, and advocate for global citizenship who served as president for Fairleigh Dickinson University for more than a decade and as president of the International Association of University Presidents. Mr. Adams believed in the power of education to prepare students for a life of service, not only for their communities, but for the larger world as well. Under his leadership, Fairleigh Dickinson became the first university in the world to earn special consultative status with the UN Economic and Social Council, in whose chamber we now sit and he supported the creation of the UN Academic Impact Initiative. Indeed, Fairleigh Dickinson became its first member school in 2010. We are honored that Susan Adams, esteemed educator in her own right and the widow of Michael, J. Michael Adams, could join us today. She is a member of the Senior Advisory Council of the International Association of University Presidents and she remains a tireless advocate for global citizenship education. Thank you, Susan, for making the journey to see us today. I would also like to welcome Mr. Yoshi Tanaka of J.F. Oberlin University in Japan, which is the UN Academic Impact Hub for work on the Charter of the United Nations. Mm. Japan's contribution overall to the United Nations I was able to get to know in a just completed visit to Tokyo, and this is very much in your spirit. Thank you. And welcome as well Mark Harris, the 2016 J. Michael Adams Lecture Speaker and the driving force behind the Many Languages, One World International Essay Contest to advance multilingualism and global citizenship among college students. More than 70 years ago, 51 countries met in San Francisco with one fundamental aim in mind to build a world committed to the ideals of peace and security. These two values were seen as the pillars through which fundamental objectives like social progress, 
better living standards and human rights could be achieved. After the scourge of two world wars, it was time for change. The founding nations believed in the power of future generations to serve as the catalyst for this change, as the bedrock of a better, more peaceful world. We too believe in future generations as well as in present ones, in their innovation and empathy, but above all their refusal to settle for the world they inherited and their courage to build a better, brighter, bolder one. It was to engage the work of youth and educators in the work of the UN that former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon launched UNAI in 2010. Since then, bridges have been built with more than 1,300 universities in 130 countries. UNAI works with members to amplify projects and research being conducted on the work and objectives of the UN, most prominently the SDGs. UNAI member schools are working on projects in their communities to advance key areas such as access to education, climate action, gender equality and more. From the work by Rochil University in Denmark on climate-friendly asphalt that reduces fuel consumption in accordance with Global Goal 13 on climate action, to the work of students and staff at Al-Farabi Kazakh National University to develop solutions to the need to build more sustainable cities. From Universidad, Universidad sorry, to La Punta's work in Argentina to reach refugee families, to teach them the language and job skills they will need to settle in their new countries, to TKM College in Kerala, India, which designs and builds low-cost homes for those of low income who were impacted by floods. These are just a handful of hundreds of incredibly innovative and exciting initiatives being carried out by member schools all around the world. From different continents, countries and cultures, they are working towards building a better future. You can learn more about the work of hundreds of UNAI member schools at the UNAI website, <coughs> academicimpact, all one word, dot UN dot org. Building a better future has been also the work of our keynote, spe sorry, sp keynote speaker today. Cora Weiss has been at the forefront of the fight for civil and human rights, peace and nuclear disarmament, women's empowerment, peace education, and the abolition of war for more than four decades. Maybe you disagree with some aspect of that. Cora was also among the small group of civil society women who drafted Security Council Resolution 1325, unanimously adopted in 2000, and which forms the foundation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda that gives women a voice in peacemaking, peace building and peacekeeping, and ensures that gender is mainstreamed in all peace and security efforts. Cora currently serves as the president of the Hague Appeal for Peace, and she also serves on the board of Peace Boat US. She has been president of the International Peace Bureau and now serves as its UN representative. She has also been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. I cannot think of a more suitable speaker for the fifth annual UNAI J. Madam Michael Adams lecture. Ms. Weiss, thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to what you have to tell us. Thank you, Alison. <clears throat> I'd like to meet the woman you, re you just described. <laughs> we all would. <laughs> After that Next film, you. it's a little hard to use words where so many pictures told the story. Dear friends, it's nice to see so many friends here. Mrs. Adams, Alison, it's a delight and a great honor to be the fifth J. Michael Adams speaker. I'm sorry I never met him, but I did meet uh, Fairleigh Dickinson's first president and founder, Peter Sammartino, who set the tone for global education 
for fostering international understanding. The Hague Appeal for Peace Conference in 1999 had its beginnings in 1899 when the First World Peace Congress convened in The Hague. It was called for by the then Tsar of Russia who couldn't afford any more weapons and the 19-year-old Queen of the Netherlands who supported peace. The goal was to serve the interests of humanity and the needs of civilization. It was for government representatives, but there was one woman, Bertha von Suttner, a peace activist who was among the delegates. She established the Austrian Peace Society and later was among the founders and vice president of the International Peace Bureau, which I now represent at the UN. In 1905, Bertha was the first woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize for her work against militarism, anti-Semitism, and nationalism, all causes of violent conflict. Her book, Die Waffenlieder, Lay Down Your Arms, was the bestseller on disarmament. In 1876, Bertha answered an ad and went to Paris to work for Alfred Nobel as his secretary and housekeeper. It lasted only two weeks, during which time she persuaded Nobel to apply the profit from his invention of dynamite to a Nobel Peace Prize. The 1899 Congress promoted the Pacific settlement of disputes, established the permanent court of arbitration, and called for a ban on, quote, throwing projectiles from hot air balloons, which included bombs, banning the use of mustard gas, and dum-dum bullets. It was the first of what were to be three peace congresses. The next, in 1907, was proposed by Teddy Roosevelt, but convened by Tsar Nicholas II and had strong civil society support, especially from the US. Two million women from 20 countries signed a petition hoping for more disarmament measures. Those conventions of 1899 and 1907 laid out the beginnings of the laws of war, which were intended to try to avoid war altogether and led to the League of Nations. There was to be a third Congress in 1915. Instead, we had World War I, the Great War, the war to end all wars. It was October 1996 when eight people sat around a glass top table at the church center across the street from here. You can't bang on glass. It should be used in diplomacy. Two Nobel Peace Laureate organizations, the International Peace Bureau and the International Phys Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, were joined by the International Association of Lawyers Against Nuclear Arms and the World Federalist Movement. Three of the organizations had demonstrated their mobilizing effectiveness when they brought petitions with millions of signatures to the World Court in 1999, calling for a decision on the illegality of nuclear weapons. Lydia Swart of the World Federalists asked us, why shouldn't civil society do what governments fail to do and hold the Third Peace Congress? that had been planned and was prevented by the First World War. Fast forward, May 1999 in The Hague on the centennial of the world's first Peace Congress, 10,000 people from over 100 countries debated for three days an issue which is now a document, The Hague Agenda for Peace and Justice for the 21st Century. It's a UN document. A5498. It's a 50-point program for getting from a culture of violence to a culture of peace. 
At the Congress, we use the three themes from 1899, disarmament and human security, prevention, resolution, and transformation of conflict, international humanitarian and human rights laws and institutions. And we added a fourth, root causes of war, culture of peace. We held PREPCOM meetings in every region of the world so we could gather international contributions to an agreement on the agenda for peace and justice. It resulted from a democratic process of 1,000 civil society organizations and individuals. In collaboration with the UN Department for Disarmament Affairs, UNICEF, UNESCO, the Special Representative for Children in Armed Conflict, and the Office of the UN Secretary General. We called this process the new democratic diplomacy. We thought then that we were emerging from the bloodiest and most war-ridden century in history. Indeed, until now, or until then, it was the bloodiest. On the eve of a new century, we said it was time to create the conditions for which the primary aim of the UN, as stated in the Charter, we the peoples determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, could be realized. That is the goal of the Hague Appeal for Peace. And I want to propose that that be the theme of the 75th anniversary of the UN in 2020. It's time to have a campaign to end the scourge of war. War No More will be the theme of the CETON Committee on Teaching About the UN annual conference in this building on a Friday in April 2020. It's time for the force of law to trump the law of force. Excuse the better use of that word. <laughs> Judge Christy Wiramontri, the late Sri Lankan former justice and vice president of the World Court, said that international law cannot possibly depend on the enforcement of its decrees through armed force. It's time to develop alternatives to war. The UN Charter, Article 2.4, which everyone should have, says that members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. Under international law, there is the Caroline Incident Principle of 1842 Self-defense is justified only where the necessity of defense is instant, overwhelming, and leaving no choice, leaving no moment for deliberation. If you want to make war, you need to go and ask the Security Council. But be careful, because General MacArthur warned us that the next great advance in the evolution of civilization cannot take place until war is abolished. The 1999 conference in The Hague under the banners of peace as a human right and time to abolish war was called the largest peace conference in history. We prepared for 3,000, but the huge participation came because NATO was bombing Serbia and Kosovo in response to ethnic cleansing. That nearly broke up our conference. We received thousands of names on petitions to condemn the bombing and the other to support it. We decided to do neither and instead set up rooms with open mics where anyone could express their views. Today we're meeting here when the sounds of war between Ukraine and Russia over a shared waterway are threatening. The tension there over five years with 10,000 dead should have been and could have been settled. War is far too dangerous, especially with a nuclear power, to even contemplate. The Hague Appeal for Peace Conference 
was unique because civil society called it, paid for it, and organized it, never done on such a scale before. We demonstrated the role civil society must play as the conscience of the world. It was also unique because we invited governments, international non-governmental organizations, including the UN, to participate equally with civil society. We established the Global Campaign for Peace Education. To reach peace, we need to teach peace. Peace education is to develop democracy and prepare citizens for active participation in society. It is to teach for and about human rights, gender equality, disarmament, nonviolence, sustainable development, including the SDGs, traditional peace practices, and today I add prevention of climate change. Peace does not come with our DNA, and we can learn to talk to those we consider the enemy, learn to settle disputes before they become lethal. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, more than an end to war, we need an end to the beginning of war. We can learn prevention, cooperation, making peace, and sustaining it. There are universities for war, but I believe you peace is the only university for peace. Thank you, United Nations. H.G. Wells, in 1921, said that history becomes a race between education and catastrophe. Bertha von Suttner said, whatever is expressed by the peace movement is not a dream dreamt by people far removed from reality. It is rather civilization's drive to sustain itself. Nothing happens unless first a dream our poet Stephen Spender wrote. If the world could abolish apartheid, said Archbishop Desmond Tutu, why not war? After all, humanity and the UN also abolished slavery and colonialism. Women have the right to vote. No one here is smoking. Partners of the same gender can marry. And, if it's okay for me to boast, there will be 118 women in our Congress. Change, change happens. Change comes fast, change comes slow, but change come, says Caroline in Tony Kushner's play. Have we failed the charter? When we initially called for the abolition of war, people thought we were crazy. Following the huge conference in 1999, where Indian, Pakistani, and Kashmiris read each other's poetry, where we displayed photos taken by young people answering the question, what does peace look like? Music was everywhere to complement speeches. We heard directly from victims of war. Since then, including my dentist this morning at the dental office, it's about time we abolished war. One highlight of the conference, as Allison mentioned in her opening, was the unscheduled gathering of women who talked about getting the Security Council to act on calling for women to participate in decision-making at all levels of governance and in peace processes. A year later, in October 2000, the Security Council unanimously adopted Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security, another great United Nations achievement. The resolution was drafted by a handful of civil society women who were at The Hague in collaboration with UNIFEM, the predecessor of UN Women. The collaboration of civil society with government members and UN staff 
is a perfect role model for the cooperation that's necessary to prevent the scourge of war. Governments alone won't do it, and civil society hasn't the power to do it. But together, it can happen. 1325 is international law and a peace resolution. It calls for the prevention of violent conflict, for women to participate at all levels of governance and at peace tables. We have painfully learned that women like men are not homogeneous. So while we call for equality for women, equal rights for everyone, we need to call for peace and justice and equality loving women to be at decision making and peace tables. It takes more than ovaries. We have learned that when peace women are included in negotiating peace agreements, the agreements last longer. We also know if, if there's a serious gender gap in the treatment of men and women in the society, we can predict that country will engage in violent conflict. We just learned that Iraq is working on its second national action plan for 1325 following a workshop run by the Global Network of Women Peace Builders, which asked, what is the role of journalism, peace, and gender? The role of mass media, said a local journalist, is to hold the government accountable and break the traditionally conservative stereotypes around gender in Iraq. In June, the UN convened a high-level meeting on peace building and sustaining peace. Prevention is at the top of the agenda. Sustaining peace is an effort at preventing the outbreak, escalation, continuation, and recurrence of conflict. The human and economic costs of managing conflict have reached levels overwhelming the international system. The number of wars has tripled since 2010, and the global humanitarian appeal in 2017 was over $23 billion. So maybe the time for war to go has come. Sustaining peace may be more of a national project, but it is very welcome. There are so many new ways, new tools to disrupt life, pit people against each other, almost bloodless wars, including artificial intelligence, cyber warfare, drones, for which there are no regulations. Even social media can also be used to spread hate, fake news, and foment violence. We also have the SDGs, which are portrayed as detachable blocks, with the penultimate block, like a last thought, calls for peaceful societies. I'm a fan of the SDGs, but I would be a bigger fan if the blocks were not siloed, not detachable, but integrated like a huge pie. We can't have development while bombs are dropping, and we can't have peace without development. So we need to see the SDGs as a holistic effort. Disarmament needs to be a part of them, as does peace education. And it takes more than reading, writing, and arithmetic. We need reconciliation, the fourth R. And we need the full implementation of Security Council Resolution 1325 because if there are no women, there's no peace. So what does 1999 in the Hague Appeal for Peace Congress have to do with 2020, the 75th anniversary of the UN? In 99, we called for the abolition of war and peace as a human right. The UN Charter still calls for we the peoples, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. 75 years after the birth of this amazing peace organization, why can't we declare 2020 the year of peace and launch the campaign to end the scourge of war? The idea was first proposed years ago by Ambassador William Vanden Heuvel. 
I believe it's the fierce urgency of now. Dr. Martin Luther King also said, it is as possible and as urgent to put an end to war and violence between nations and peaceable and peoples as it is to put an end to poverty and racial injustice. The endless wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Libya, Syria, and now Yemen are killing thousands, starving thousands, raping untold numbers, wounding and traumatizing millions, destroying homes and fields and entire villages. The only winners will be the contractors who rebuild the cities and the corporations who make and sell military equipment. People are tired of war. It was civil society that persuaded governments to convene the 1899 and 1907 Congresses, which created the laws of war and led to the League of Nations. Since the end of World War II, wars have not <coughs> achieved the purposes for which they were fought. Indeed, wars create more problems. Afghanistan is a model. There are more Taliban and Al-Qaeda caused casualties. An Afghan widow sold her six-year-old daughter for $3,000 to avoid family starvation. She's only seen $75. She is not unique. Four years of drought coupled with devastating warfare has destroyed agriculture. It's time for civil society globally, together with give governments through the United Nations, to put an end to war. Secretary General Guterres launched an agenda for disarmament. He focused on the threat of weapons and urged support for talks to end the Korean War, denuclearize the peninsula, and preserve the Iran deal. His strongest appeal was for three priorities, disarmament to save humanity, disarmament that saves lives, and disarmament for future generations. The total elimination of nuclear weapons is in the DNA of the UN, and it remains the priority to which I reaffirm my commitment. Those were the words of Guterres, the SG. Remember that, 18, that 189 member states have signed on to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the most universal treaty in the history of arms control. Article 6 says, each of the parties to the treaty undertakes to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to the cessation of nuclear arms race at an early date and to nuclear disarmament under strict and effective international control. This is not a pipe dream. Nuclear weapons are one of the two most frightening threats to survival of people and the planet. The other is climate change. And if, if a nuclear weapon were ever used, it would hasten the pace of climate change. They have everything in common and nothing in conflict. One takes minutes to destroy life, the ozone layer, create nuclear winter. The other takes longer, but both are apocalyptic and omnicidal. There will be hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, of environmental refugees trying to escape the heat of the tropical belt. Where will they be let in? And I cry for the situation at the border today. There will be fires as we've just experienced in California, rising sea levels, drowning islands, drought and flooding. Now we have ICANN, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, winner of last year's Nobel Peace Prize for, for mobilizing civil society to persuade governments to support the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. As of today, there are 69 signatories to the Ban Treaty, and 19 countries have ratified it. They need to get to 50 
to put it into force. It requires countries to negotiate, but none of the nine nuclear countries support it because they're too busy modernizing and increasing their nuclear arsenals. On June 12, 1982, one million people from all over the world packed Central Park and cried out, goodbye nuclear weapons, as balloons were released. In 1996, the International Court of Justice declared that the threat and use of nuclear weapons is generally illegal under international law, and in a unanimous opinion, agreed, quote, there exists an obligation to pursue in good faith and bring to a conclusion negotiations leading to nuclear disarmament in all its aspects. Just one month ago today, human, Michel Bachelet's Human Rights Committee issued a fantastic decision. The threat or use of nuclear weapons violates the right to life and may amount to a crime in international law. Thank you, Mrs. Bushlet. We should all be working to prevent global warming, which creates climate change, and to eliminate nuclear weapons. We need everyone educated on the nature of these related threats to our survival. We need to keep all our countries respecting the multinational agreements they signed and committed to carry out. If we're not with the rule of law, we are outlaws. How do we abolish war? How do we prevent climate change? How do we pre protect ourselves and our planet from nuclear war? Certainly not by dropping bombs or sending armed soldiers. We can approach all three the same way and at the same time. I believe we have to start with major educational efforts, starting with children. Peace education is essential. We have to have gender equality and equality for all. We have to reduce military budgets as called for by the Charter of the UN, which will release funds for domestic needs. We have to get our political representatives to cut gas emissions, cut mines, go solar, reduce fossil fuels, Join your local climate organization, your local peace organization, your UN association, and members of this UN can all sign on to the crime of aggression Kampala Amendment to the Rome Statute. See Liechtenstein for more information. It's very important. Bring up these issues. Remember what Dr. King said. It's as possible and as urgent to put an end to war and violence between nations as it is to put an end to poverty and racism. Every country needs a foreign policy safe for children, a feminist foreign policy. We need to become exhausted from exhausting all kinds of diplomacy before even thinking about resorting to force. It takes more than one man to negotiate a ceasefire. There are mediators beyond borders, retired diplomats. We need to fan out, work so hard as if our future depends on it, because it does. Nobel laureate physicist Stephen Hawking said, the human failing I would most like to correct is aggression. The quality to amplify is empathy. It brings us together in a peaceful, loving state. Our dear departed Kofi Annan told our Hague Appeal for Peace conference participants, don't be discouraged, don't despair, and by all means, don't ever give up. And in the words of a poet, Eve Miriam, 
One day our daughter's daughter will look up and ask, Mommy, what is war? Thank you. I'd really like to thank Cor Cora Weiss from the bottom of my heart for this very timely reminder of why we, why we must be unrelenting in our quest for peace and security. Perhaps the most surprising part of your speech was the idea that in 1899, two million women signed up for the peace agenda without the aid of the internet or other people in communications or the fax to machine. or the fax machine or the telephone Does I guess was there the fax yeah, I do <laughs> or the telex machine remember that so thank you very much this was a good reminder of why we must be unrelenting in our quest for peace and security okay. it's a road that may not be easy but it really is imperative that we embark upon the journey and it's now my pleasure to introduce someone who has embarked on that journey Enyo on Susan Sebit, this year's recipient of the Global Network of Women Peacebuilders Cora Weiss Fellowship for Young Women Peacebuilders. Ms. Sebit is a human rights lawyer from South Sudan. Just that sentence must tell you how hard her life is. She advocates for women's access to justice in East Africa. She is also the co-founder and executive director for the National Alliance for Women Lawyers, where she worked towards ending violence against women and implementing the women, peace, and security agenda in South Sudan. She has also served as a legal advisor to the African Union Youth Parliament. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so excited to be here today, and I would like to thank the organizers for, invite, for this invitation, and more especially Cora Wise for giving me this opportunity to share this discussion with a very important expert in peace building, especially on women participation. My name is Nguyen Susan Sebit. I'm a South Sudanese, and I'm actually a lawyer I'm a Cora Wise Fellow with Global Network of Women Peace Builders. Thank you so much, Cora, for giving me this opportunity. This fellowship has helped me, and actually it's helped, I mean, like, it's going to give me a very important exposure to meet various people of your kind. At the Global Network of Women Peace Builders, it is through this fellowship that I am here today, and I'm in New York to share my reflection and experience of the work I had been doing back home. We walked through a lot of a difficult situations as young women and as a woman who come from South Sudan, a country that has been affected by war. And I'm actually one of the persons who have experienced different type of war when I was a little kid when we, the SPLA fought the government of Sudan, and I have experienced another war that erupted in 2013. Being a South Sudanese woman, I would like to share with you how conflict directly affected the life of women in my country. Women experience various forms of violence and are subjected to human rights abuses from their family levels to the unknown perpetrators. This, this war has affected women in many ways. Women has been affected through uh, violence sexually, psychologically, and also physically. The, the women who cross the borders to the countries next to South Sudan, the neighboring countries due to conflict, are also exposed to so many challenges and many violence. Girls are being I mean, being married off at a very young age, abduction of young girls, with increment in the dowries that has fueled the communal conflicts. And this conflict contributed to loss of life. When war broke out in South Sudan in 2013, women lost a lot of things, their livelihood properties, 
they lost their husbands, their children, and they are sexually and physically assaulted and affected as well. Without any accountability, the parties have not taken it to protect their vulnerable citizens, especially women and girls and children too. South Sudan is a party to the United Nations and it is mandated to accede to all the resolution, including the 1325. And this 1325 is to protect the women and, children and girls during the conflict. In 2015, the National Action Plan was adapted and developed based on the principle of 1325. But still, the space is very limited for women to participate in the implementation of the 1325 and more especially the action plan. Women have no capacity, they, have no, they are vulnerable in terms of economy, they don't have political space to participate in decision making, they don't have support from both parties. Most of the women are illiterate, so illiteracy contributed to lack of their participation. However, some of the United Nations agents, such as UN Women, has been trying their best to make sure women participate in peace building and in the peace process. It is not very late. The recent peace agreement signed, if the parties acceded to it and they implement it, there is a still chance for women to participate in this peace and to participate in the meaningful decision making. As we are all aware, a peace where women are part of it is sustainable for some time, like Cora put earlier. And where women's rights are not determined, there is already a prediction of violence. If this South Sudan peace is not being gender sensitive, I would like to assure you that we will not be in peace for long, unless women are part of it. And it is a mandate of the United Nations to ensure that they support the women of South Sudan in peace building and to participate in decision making. Women cannot be part of the political decisions because they have no resource, they are, very, they are economically dis disadvantaged, they are also culturally disadvantaged, but if there is a space to create women, to create for women to participate, it will be a great opportunity for women of South Sudan, including myself, who has experienced the violence, the grave violence women experience in South Sudan. Mm. I'm a survivor, I can say so, of the two war. Young people are the, are the majority in South Sudan, and they are the one fighting the war, because the politicians are all, and they are there designing the policies of how to, how to fight. So the young people are the one in the battlefield. And this affected them in terms of generational gaps. Young people of my generation are, are dying, and they have already died when they were very young due to the, the first war. So when you look into this, South Sudan will have a generational gaps, and it will, have, it will lack good leaders because young people have, they have died during the war. However, it's not very late to, to support the youth we have a number of young people who have come up this time with initiatives to promote peace, like the Anataban. Anataban is an Arabic word. It's an initiative that youth, young women and young men, has come up and they say we are tired of war. And they talk about peace, they have composed songs, the peace songs, and then they, they have poetry, they draw, design, and concerts. But then this political space is not yet safe on them, it's shrinking. So there is no much freedom to exercise their talents and to mobilize the young people and to mobilize the youth to put down the guns and join them in the city or in the street of South Sudan. If young people are not also considered for peace building, I don't think there will be peace in the world, not only South Sudan. And there is a need for the United Nations and the global policy makers to consider that young people, and more especially young women, 
are put into the peace agenda. There is one important question, I mean, top uh, point I want to give you. The trauma healing. With the series of conflict that South Sudanese has experienced, there is, is, there is a serious trauma in our society, including myself. So don't be surprised that I'm not traumatized, but we are traumatized in one way or the other. However, if trauma healing is not considered for the people of South Sudan, especially women and children and girls and youth, it will be very difficult to address the issues and the implementation of peace agreement. Having worked for National Alliance of Women Lawyers, we have experienced and we have been exposed to many victims of sexual violence who are traumatized due to assault, but there is no space to give them the trauma cycle, social support or, or healing. This has been very, very difficult for our organization and other organizations working on trauma healing too to handle victims of violence. I would like to thank Global Network of Women Peace Builders for giving me this opportunity once again because as South Sudanese, we don't, as young South Sudanese women working for peace, we don't have a space. We don't have chance to have this space to communicate our rules and to communicate the vices women are going through. I would like to stop from here and thank you so much. Thank you very much for that moving contribution. Um, it perfectly segues into what I want to say, that one of the principal tenets of the UN academic impact is the belief in the importance of global citizenship in building thoughtful, empathetic leaders of tomorrow. You, I suspect, are somebody destined to take that path. It is also the goal of Susan Adams and her husband who devoted their careers to educating young people and instilling in them a sense of their shared humanity. I'd now like to invite Susan Adams to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, Michael was the primary driven person in, in higher education, and these were his goals and life. And he, he believed that Higher education in particular was, was the path to world peace, a bridge to peace. And that was part of what drove him to work to form the academic impact and, and just initiate that among the university presidents at the IAUP and then at U, the uh, United Nations has carried that even further. So it was, it was incredibly meaningful to me today to hear um, Cora tell us about having known Peter Sammartino Peter Sammartino was the founding president of uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University. And when Michael became president, he went back to Peter Sammartino's goals, which is how we became active in the United Nations and a part of a whole global effort to offer a global education to students at Fairleigh Dickinson and to be active in the United Nations. And the quote that you mentioned from H.G. Wells was one of Michael's favorites. He often included it in his um, byline under his emails. So that was uh, touched my heart to hear you say that. And it resonated in a very special way. I thank you. I thank you all for, for what you've done to perpetuate the voice of what civil activity can do for peace. And I uh, thank Ramu and his staff you know, for what they've done to organize these events in Michael's memory. Thank, thank you all, you, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Susan, for your continued work on behalf of global citizenship and for carrying forward the legacy of J. Michael Adams. We have a few minutes left, and I'd like to open the floor up to questions from the audience. 
If you have a question, please raise your hand and then identify yourself. Nobody has a question? No, it's impossible. That's not possible. <laughs> you can make a reaction, not a question. Comment. Yes, a comment perhaps? I mean, is, was anybody else as amazed as I was that in 1899 you got two million women behind a peace agenda and a teenage princess pushing mm -hmm. it? There's, there's nothing. Ah, hello. You have Could to you a, use your microphone? No, can you? No, use your microphone at the desk. A good morning to all, and uh, it's been a pleasure to be here. How does one, uh, first of all, I'm Christine Hanna, uh, CETON member, and I'm thrilled to be here, Cora, and to have met you. How does one take it from here? As a layperson, I hear your message, uh, ordinary educator, a person, family, and I believe in what you say, but how do we make a difference? Where do we go from here? Cora, would you like to? Thanks for asking. I thought I made some suggestions, but if you are, are you an educator? Yes. So you've got a school, you've got fellow educators, you could have them all for breakfast and say, how are we going to inter integrate? Peace education is not a separate course. You integrate it into the pedagogy of the school, the curriculum of the school. I know, I know about the burden that teachers live under, and I'm very sympathetic and empathetic. But there's a way of making sure that there's full participation, that you, cover, you ask questions about human rights, how I heard of somebody doing peace education in physics. I mean, after all, Stephen Hawking was a physicist and a great peacenik. So I think you should just go to school and start talking to teachers or have them for breakfast and, and see what you can do. You can go to the Global Campaign for Peace Education website, which is peaced peaced-ed-org, Peace Education Oh, shoot. I have to write it down. Peace Education Global Campaign Ed hyphen Ed hyphen Oh, shoot. Just look up Global Campaign for Peace Education and you can get curricula suggestions there for disarmament, for nuclear weapons, for peace education, and for climate change. Can you speak into the microphone? It's on. You know. OK, thank you very much. Why can't Somebody I remember my comment? own website? My god. Yeah? Go ahead. Yes, Cora, you made, uh, made an interesting point about civil society holding government responsible uh, for meeting the commitments which have been made in writing and with other international parties. Um, <clears throat> the question is, you know, how do we go from representative democracy which does not create a continuity of obligation and can, uh, can abrogate agreements which have been signed with other parties at great expense. In other words, <clears throat> we are civil society. We are. We vote as a representative democracy, and yet at the same time, the agreements which were made during the last four years are not carried forward to the next four years. Um, so, this is I don't know if you noticed, but there was a certain vote yesterday in the Senate by a certain man named Bernie Sanders I never in my life dreamt that anything he would do in Congress would get approved. He won a huge vote on the War Powers Act. It's an amazing, amazing achievement because uh, 
Congress was being ignored for what it is its uh, authority and its right. So there's hope. And I think if we keep after, and that's true for every country in the world. I don't mean to just uh, distinguish, uh, separate out our country, which is the United States. Um, but every country in the world has some form of access to the people who run it through the parliaments, uh, through the political parties, and, you, and people vote with their feet, they vote with their hands, they vote with their voice, and we just have to keep at it. Civil society is the other superpower. It's the most important thing we've got. Unarmed, nonviolent, civil society, it, makes, it can make a difference. <laughs> Certainly a rallying cry for civil society. Yes, I'm sorry, I can't see your name. His name is Doug. Doug, <laughs> please. Uh, Cora, I've um, known you and Peter for about 45 years um, when we were both younger. One of the things that I think would be really helpful would be to share with people how you balance uh, love for family, love for nation, sisterhood, and the world, uh, the world responsibilities with responsibilities to your own family. You want the secret? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you take them with you. <laughs> Our three children uh, were on every picket line that I've ever been on when they were that small, smaller. When you could still tell them what to do. <laughs> when you could still tell them what to do. Well, but they wanted to. I mean, my middle daughter just sent me a text this morning, good luck, mom. And she's, uh, she's the mother of two grown boys. Um, our son works in Congress. You just have to do what needs to be done. And when I was a child, I learned how to lick stamps and envelopes. We didn't have stick-on stamps at that time. So I don't know the answer to your question, except you have to involve everyone. And if you can take them with you, you should. Was there a question? I'd like a question from a young person, dare I be younger. that discriminatory? <laughs> We're all young. It's In spirit. A of younger. <laughs> okay. I think. Yes, yes, no. No? Good morning, everyone. I am Raghav Khanna from Amity University. I'm pursuing BBA International. So uh, here's my question. Why we have not uh, yet achieved ultimate peace in the world. What's your thought on that? Why haven't well, we achieved peace in the world? Maybe why Somebody so, else maybe can Susan answer that. You Do you want to answer Susan. why we haven't achieved peace in the world? It's from, based on your personal experience. Yeah? Thank you. I'm given the opportunity to answer that. Um, I think war is... Uh, War itself is a, a, a competition of gaining power over people and doing things you don't want to be told, and that's why many countries get into war when policies are not in place. Therefore, it is difficult to put war aside or to bring it to an end globally because okay. we have different leaders who don't want to leave power. I came from the African country, from African countries. So in the African context, we have a few leaders who want to live forever in power. And we have leaders who think they will change. So it is very difficult to bring war to an end. Yeah. But then when I was reading through the report of Hate for Peace, I, I saw one of the, the agenda they were discussing in 1999 was to not to eradicate war completely because there will still be war within the states and between the states, but rather 
to eradicate the economic injustice it was one of the things. So it is very difficult to. Okay. Thank you. War is one of the most profitable things in the world, I think, isn't it? It's certainly profitable for the, uh, the companies that make the war equipment, the bombs and the tools, yeah. the tools of war, and they love it. I don't think there's an ounce of morality in those companies, but I think we have to take away the greed. One more question there, and then I, re I really will have to wrap it up, I'm afraid. You just press the microphone in front of you. Why don't they all ask their question? Yes, Hi. blue. Yeah, could you ask your question, the two of you, in blue? And then there was one person up there in the white shirt. Mm. There are three women who have their hands up. Yeah. OK, well, these two women. Please go ahead. This opportunity. My name is Noma Zarubina, and I'm from Russia, actually. And I uh, would like to know um, about your own opinion about the crisis between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, I have political, um, I have master degree in politics, and I'm very worried about the situation because every day I hear um, uh, about Russian aggression. But my family was one year ago in Ireland, in Crimea, and uh, if we come to the island, um, we will know the people really want to live in Russia. So why everywhere we can hear about aggression? Uh, I think this is democracy if people, 96%, want to live uh, in Russia. So what do you think about this crisis? Okay, we'll address that question. Can we, the other people who had their hand up, I believe you did, and the man in the white shirt over there, and there's somebody waving at me. I, sorry. It's, so the three of you pose your questions, and then we can address them collectively. Hi, I have a question for, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Turn on your mic. Can you turn on your mic? I'm sorry. Can you hear me? No. Yeah, now we can. How oh, should keep it goes on and off. Yeah, wait for it to turn red and then that means you can speak. So it'll be green and then it'll turn red. Okay. So now you're on. Can you hear her? Yeah. She was asking if you could summarize what your work in South Sudan entail, entails. Um, if you could just talk a little bit about the work that you do and what that entails. Can we hear okay, her? now we'll get the question from the man in the white shirt there. Please switch on your microphone. Hello, Cora. This is Chris Nichols. Uh, today, it was announced that uh, students and parents in Rhode Island were filing a federal lawsuit claiming that they were the, the, they were not learning civics and that they were the violation of their constitutional rights how and when did this start where this when I was young we were taught civics we were taught the importance of citizenship and we've gradually gotten away from that in education and it's very important that they are filing this lawsuit, but it's taken them a very long time to get here. So what can we do as a society to begin to re-educate our students about the importance of citizenship and voting and understanding how government works? Okay, thank you. And then there was somebody in the row up. Yes, you. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, it um, should work. Uh, hi, I'm Daniel. I'm from the College Mount San Vicente. I um, would like to ask how can the students like me can la, like make a difference in the peace building? Because um, before today, I had never like think about like having like the wars to end. 
because it sounds like a dream, but it's like a beautiful dream that I would like to help to build. And I want to know how can I like help or what can I do as a student to to do it. Okay, I think if we could have the specific question to Ingloen, Susan answered by her. Maybe you would like to take on the uh, remark about the Connecticut lawsuit, and then Cora, you could answer the young man. I'll I'll summarise it for you. Thank you. Why don't you start? Thank you so much. Um, in my first, when I first talked here, I said. Uh, we work toward policy uh, reviews, especially laws that protect women. So National Alliance for Women Lawyers was formed to ensure the rule of law, access to justice, implementation of 1325 Women, Peace and Security are put in place. So basically we, we conduct awareness in the POC protection of civilians in, within the UN protection camps and also in the displaced camps where women and children are living and other vulnerable men in a way, or elders and others. So uh, our major work is based around the areas of protections, access to justice, rule of laws, and also we provide pro bono services, especially to those who cannot assess legal services in the country due to the expensiveness and so we are not limited to the displaced or to the refugees but we are covering the entire countries but our mandate is basically on women and children. Uh, we felt like uh, there is a need for the rule of law and accountability, women participation in peace buildings to be on the full agenda of South Sudan. Because when war broke out, women became the victims. Especially in sexual violence, rapes has been very rampant, and perpetrators are working freely. There's no sense, uh, there's no accountability. So we also license with other, other organizations to make sure victims of sexual violence are treated well sent to the good hospital and also given a psychosocial support like the psycholo psychological counseling. So basically, we also represent, because there are some time, uh, some perpetrators are, are, are caught and we take them to the court and at least the victims to get justice. Thank you. Susan, would you like to address the question on the courts? I, I'd like to do it briefly, but I need to say with the caveat that I haven't read about this law court uh, situation and I have no specific knowledge. But what you've seen over time in the education system, as your curriculum committees meet at the local level, they make decisions about what to include and what not to include. And then things are changed because so many school systems buy the books based on what happens in, in the Texas um, system where they, they oversee textbooks that are written. Just the, the whole commercialism of producing textbooks over time where actually Texas and their system has sort of regulated what comes out to students at the individual level. And so you have fits and starts with curriculums being revised. and. Uh, I think the sad part is there's not enough civic awareness and knowledge about how the curriculum gets changed unless perhaps a parent is overseeing their, their child's homework and then they, they recognize what's there or not there. It, it's just something that's gone on unnoticed for a while. And I, I believe that what you're seeing there is an activism because now they're aware. And it, it's, uh, but I actually, as I said before, I haven't actually read the lawsuit or anything. I hope that's helpful. And I think if you did research into curriculum patterns and developments, um, you, you would see the pattern that's developed in the United States. I mean, there's, I don't know, I think the latest thing we saw in the press was how Helen Keller has been deleted from the history books. 
and things like that have happened on other levels. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much for addressing it. Cora, I'd like to turn to you with the question about what can our questioner do to prevent war or to end it. Are you at school in New York State or who asked the question? He's nodding. Yes. Yes, in New York State? Yeah, yeah, tempo temporarily. There is an organization called Peace Action that has chapters in 20 colleges in New York State. And if you give me your contact, I'll give it to them happily, and that you can work with a, peace, a student peace group, college students. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, you can contact the local chapters of the American Civil Liberties Union, or other legal, uh, nonprofit legal groups who are looking for advocates for the refugees who are fleeing violence trying to get asylum in the United States. You can uh, start a club in your school and uh, a peace club or a peace and climate change Peace, yes, climate change, no club. You have to just use your imagination and do what's comfortable, what you feel good doing, what you're interested in doing, and what you'll think you'll get a response from your fellow students. But if you give me your card, and if you want to show this movie, I can send you the link. It's a Vimeo, right? Or you can send them the link. Yeah. Get the link from Ramo, it's much better. <laughs> And that can start a discussion. And we have just finished a discussion now because I'm afraid our time has run short. If you have another question, perhaps one of our speakers can address it quickly if you come and find us on the podium afterwards. It's just we are under house rules to get out of here. Um, other people need the space. But I really would like to thank Cora Weiss, Susan Adams, and NU1, Susan Sebit for really thoughtful contributions. And please, thank you so much for all being here today, joining us. We hope that in your studies, at your workplace, in your words, and in your actions, you continue to do the very important task of building a more peaceful and just world. Thank you very much.